put a coat of um, water-based finish on the underside of this tabletop um, and I want to put two more coats on and I'm experimenting with a new a new brand that I've been working with and um, it's amazing really this first coat really fuzzed up the surface this second coat uh, will be when I sand this it's like silk uh, I'm surprised because this is just plywood so I'm getting ready to put another coat on on the other side and then um, it'll be uh, waterproof from the underside. I'm not sure, it doesn't say to sand between coats which might mean that they want the toothing from the first coat to uh, to adhere to. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to experiment and I'm going to sand just halfway because in the past I've used water based finish and I've sanded between coats and I've found that the second coat didn't adhere to the first one. So I'm going to do half because this is the underside so it wouldn't really matter. Uh, so I'm going to do my experiment on this side. And I'll put my second coat on the rough. This is rough here. This is smooth here. And then I'll see what I get. It's just an experiment. It's just what you do. I'm rolling this on. I'm going to, and actually I'm going to experiment. Normally I would roll this on and, and then I would go with a paint pad and, and stretch those lines so I'm going along the grain like I'm doing here. But um, I'm going to just roll this on and see how it feels after I've put it on and watch it. So I'm watching this over 24 hours to see how this finish stretches once it's dried, once it's drying. So across the grain here, and then go with the grain with the roller. Most of them do not advise using a roller, and I think it's because rollers tend to put bubbles in the finish. But I want to see how I feel. I like these experiments that I do often. They come up with something new. When I grow older, losing my hair many years from now, will you still be sending me a valentine? Birthday greeting, a bottle of wine, send me a postcard. In front of you, will you still need me? Will you still need me? When I'm 64. Okay, good. Okay, okay, Google. Play When I'm 64. All right, When I'm 64 by the Beatles. Well, Play on YouTube music. Your phone. Okay. Will you still need me? Will you still need me? When I'm 64. This area just feels smoother because I sanded this one, if you remember, and this one feels really rough. So I'm going to go with 150 grit. The nice thing about uh, the um, waterborne finishes is they sand so nicely. So I'm just uh, rough coating. This with a 150 grit. Now remember I didn't sand this surface so uh, I left it rough from the bandsaw. Uh, no, not, I left it rough from the planing. Of course that's not like a sanded finish so there was raised grain in other words steam from the planing because of the end grain element. And uh, 
So now I'm sanding it, and, and actually, does it feel? It does feel as smooth as the uh, area that I sanded between the first and second coat. What my plan this time is I'm going to brush coat the first quarter, roll the second quarter, brush coat the third quarter, and roll out the, the last quarter. Just so I can see what the difference is between the rolled coats and the brushed coats. So I like doing these little experiments just for my own sanity, my own peace of mind. And it gives me something I can share with other people who listen to what I have to say and ask questions. And I must say, obviously, the brush is, uh, is looking a lot smoother than I would get with the roller, which I expect. No gaps. This is great experimenting on the underside of a project like this. Looks good. That's the other thing I like about this um, water-based finishes, uh, or water-borne finish, whichever, is the, the surfaces are remarkably hard. They're less, uh, seem like less flexible than uh, so I had some amazing um, water-based finishes for guitars and, uh, and so on, for stringed instruments. Remarkable. They look so deep. So I'm going to leave that overnight. I'm going to go clean my brush and stuff, and then I'll be good to go. quieter here. I'm glad somebody put the sign up there because it does tell you we're in Texas. Barbed wire. Blue bonnets. The blue bonnets are past their best now but when they're out the whole stem it's a lupin, uh, lupinus and it thrives, uh, like the mesquite, it thrives, they thrive on poor soil and they add nitrogen, they fix nitrogen in the soil, so that's why they're often here. But uh, cacti, mmm, lots of live oaks back there. These are live oaks in the background here, guys, uh, mostly. There's an odd uh, oak. Uh, mesquite somewhere around. Thank goodness this is part of my history. I'm very grateful for that. I think it's nice to have things that you can remember as part of your history. My children came here with me different times in their lives. And they are, two of, uh, two of them are born Texans. Mighty proud of it too. So here I am in my rugged Texas, some lying down dead mesquite there, which I would convert into product without any doubt at all. But I just wanted to take you underneath the mesquite tree here because when you walk under the mesquites, the light is so different. It's a very subtle softness to it. It softens everything. And of course, mesquite brings up more moisture to the surface than it consumes. And it gives off that moisture through the leaves. So this is where a good rancher He's planted, he's let, allowed a few mesquites to grow on the land just to cover the land. This would be very good for the cattle. Cattle can live on powdered mesquite trunk. If it's powdered up, they will eat it and consume it. But uh, what I think mostly happens is the cattle feed on the bean pods, which are very good for them. They're very nutritious. And um, this is one of the loveliest places I think I could ever take you to. This is where one day maybe we'll all get together out here in Texas, talk about wood, talk about the trees, 
and talk about the tools and the way we can work it. Look at the way these limbs spread, short stem over there, very short, very typical of mesquite, short stem. But you, it's surprising what you can make from these trees. So these are the frond-like leaves, I love them, don't you? The way they just dangle, they're so gentle and so, so soft here. They're just so soft, I love this. I feel such peace out here, really. They're so peaceful, so restful. For those of you who know nothing about Texas, this is going to be an eye-opener for you. This is an anthill, and it, the reason this is mounded up so much is because it's been raining, so ants will bring their eggs up to the surface. But watch when I scuff this with my foot, and you'll start to see why they're called fire ants. See how quickly they come up to defend their turf? Literally. And they scurry, they will move rapidly, so you want to make sure, because these things, when they bite, they can indeed kill you, no doubt about it. These are live oaks, and that's a live oak that's dead, that dropped 20, 30 years ago, probably, I'm guessing. But live oaks are often places where people build the same way pecans were um, because there was usually water somewhere around so you could sink a well and you could live on the water from that well. I just pulled off the interstate I-34, I-35, no not 34, and I am by Baylor University and uh, I came in to take a peek at Coffee Grounds, which is a local coffee house right by the university, and it's really it reminds me of when I go to Mexico or somewhere like that, where I come into a situation where most of everything would be utilization. Well, I had a coffee, and the coffee was very good. Uh, it's relatively quiet today, but it's a good place to chill, so I can recommend it. So if you get into Waco, Texas, you'd enjoy it here, I think. No trip to Texas would be the same without a few long holes in there. Look at that, Mama. Nice, huh? I did forget to tell you about these things, these prongs. These, these thorns are the ones the, cat, the uh, ranchers hate because they will get in your tires. There's a turkey buzzard flying over me above there. He's waiting for me to die. Hi. I thought you might want to see my face a little bit. So now you've seen where a big part of my journey was, living here in the hill country of Texas. And um, it was really a significant part of my life and the best part of my life, really. This is, there are several reasons for that, not the least of which was the wildness that I loved so much and the, the way that um, Texans loved me and cared for me and took me in in different state in different places you know they absorbed aspects of my life bought my furniture bought my small goods that kind of thing and supported me and i think that's typical of texans really i think it's typical of a lot of americans not just texans but it is really a this is a beautiful place place to be this is actually a river crossing, so you would cross here to go to your ranch, so it, it may be a little wild, but I've crossed these river crossings. They've been deeper and wider, they've been up to my axle. I've had to make sure I re-greased after I'd gone through them with my truck. 
But this is the kind of place that I went to harvest my mesquite. So it'll give you an idea of, of uh, the roughness and the ruggedness that I went to to uh, get that mesquite. You can see down below here the grass is all being thrust in one direction. So the river was up quite high at one point and that was fairly a, a fairly frequent thing. Enjoying my trip here and uh, I've so enjoyed it. Liz and I have been coming up the loop and we've just enjoyed it so much. The flowers, the butterflies, the trees, it's been great. So this is it. You'll love Texas if you come to Texas. This is April, best time of year to be here. Not quite too hot but 80, 85 degrees today, that's Fahrenheit, so it's not really very hot. Love Texas.